Um, my name is Lisa Bunting. I'm a lecturer in social work at Queen's University. And I'm here with my colleagues, um, Claire and Gavin, to talk about the findings from a project that we've just recently finished, which was looking at child welfare inequalities within the child protection system. And we're not shifting. Got it. Now this was um, a project, like I say, which we recently finished in the past couple of months. We, we launched the UK findings in London of February this year. We're hoping to have um, a broader confidence for Northern Ireland in October. But basically what the project was about was a, it's four nations comparative research. We're interested in looking at the experiences of the four nations in terms of official data collection around the child protection system and looking at child welfare interventions. And what we mean by that is children who are known to social services who would be categorised as being children in need, children who are at risk of abuse and have been identified as such and placed on the child protection register, and those children who have become looked after by the state. So this is all official data that is collected across each of the four nations, including Northern Ireland. And when we're talking about inequality, what we're trying to explore is the idea that these children and their families experience unequal chances of coming into contact with these particular systems and being categorised and intervened with in particular ways. So a bit of background about the project, project itself. Um, the idea was that um, we were extending the, the findings from an initial pilot. So the overall project was led by Professor Paul Bywaters of Coventry University. And he had conducted an initial pilot in the Midlands, trying to look at the, the relationship between the numbers of children and the rates of children on child protection plans and being looked after with area level measures of deprivation. And the rationale for this was we have a huge amount of literature which links poverty and child abuse and neglect. We can go backwards and forwards about whether this is causal or not, but there is a very clear and strong link. Despite knowing this, no nation within the UK collects any data about the family background characteristics of any child who comes into contact with the system. So we simply do not know the characteristics of the children who come into care. We do not know their parents' religion. We do not measure um, their background. We do not look at some of the, the issues that they have at any kind of quantitative level. So we're intervening in their lives. We're taking and using legislation to remove some children from their parents and place them in other places, but we still have very little sense, more than 20 years after the children order, of who these children actually are and where they come from. So a key part of that was trying to flesh this out in terms of linking where, where we could with area level measures of deprivation. And what um, Paul found in the original study was a very clear graded relationship between levels of deprivation and increased risk of being on a child protection plan. Now, this is quite unusual in terms of social sciences to see this kind of strength of relationship. You can see the rate there for the most deprived in, the, in number one is seven per 10,000. In the 10th, 10% 10 most deprived areas, it's up to 70 per 10,000. So it's a tenfold increase in risk depending on where you live in the English Midlands. We see an even stronger relationship in terms of being looked after. Somewhere between 11 and 12 times greater the risk from those in the most affluent areas compared with those in the most deprived areas. So what we wanted to do in terms of our own research project was obviously they're complex systems. So there are policy frameworks, there are operational assessment processes, there are staff management resource issues which all come into play. So a big part of this was also trying to make sense of how we might be able to compare the different nations, how we might understand the different policy contexts to try and interpret our findings. A key element of it was quantitative data analysis where we were linking up official data with area level indicators of deprivation and trying to look and see if there was any kind of influence in regards to age, gender, ethnicity, um, legal status, reasons for being on the register. So we linked up with administrative data based around the multiple um, deprivation index. And we also 
wanted to try and delve into this a little bit more by looking at in-depth case studies, particularly in, these were conducted in England and Scotland, but it's something that we're hoping to develop in the next phase of the project in Northern Ireland. So what do we do here in Northern Ireland? We got access to our data via the Honest Broker Service, and if people aren't aware of that, it's kind of a, a service that provides anonymized access to routinely collected healthcare data. So they provide us with access to data collected on the social services source care system, and we had data on all cases that were open at the 31st of March 2015. And they also licked the postcodes for the family of origin at the time of the referral to super output area. And that was to give us an indicator of deprivation. And for us in Northern Ireland, super um, output areas are a small area geography. It's about 890 in Northern Ireland with an average population of 2,000 people. So in terms of how our data measured up with what we know from official statistics, once we had the, the data cleaned, you know, as with any process, there's always a number of issues here, we find that generally speaking, we were in and around 5% of the range that we would expect from official statistics. So we had data on around about 24,000 children. There were some variations that we noticed, and I think that's just worth noting. Um, where there's 100 less on the CPR that we could identify in the Belfast Trust and some variations in terms of children who were looked after in relation to the Belfast, Southeastern and Western Trust. And we've explored this with statisticians. We think it's a combination of effects. Official statistics are based on aggregate returns. We were looking at individual level statistics, so it's easier for mistakes to creep into aggregate returns. We also think that at one point there was a practice in some places for children who'd been in long-term care for people to change the family of origin postcode to the foster care or long-term care placement, which may have impacted the stats. But broadly speaking, we're well within a strong range and we're representative of what we know in terms of official statistics. Um, before looking at the findings from our analysis, it's also worth noting high deprivation is spread across the, the Northern Ireland population. As you can see, it's across the child population. It's fairly evenly distributed, as it's intended to be, across those 10 deciles. So when we're looking at this data statistically, if we see that same pattern, we don't see a relationship with the intervention. It just follows the norm of the population. What we do see, though, is a very different pattern. So if we look at child protection rates, and looked after rates. We've got child protection in the grey there. Again, we see that same graded relationship. It doesn't follow the flat line of the normal population. It systematically increases. So it's six times higher for those who live in the most deprived 10% of areas compared with those who live in the 10% most affluent areas. We have the same graded relationship with looked after children. And here, those people in the most deprived 10% of areas have a four fourfold increased risk compared with those in the most affluent 10%. <clears throat> I did include lots of other graphs. I'm not going to bore you with the details of those. But then we looked across the various variables that we had, tested stati statistically to see if there was any kind of variations. And our key findings are, as I've already identified, there is a very clear social gradient increased risk of becoming placed in the child protection register and becoming looked after. We see that this impacts males and females, boys and girls, similarly. We see that the same pattern in terms of the social gradient for age, but we see some variation. So not to four-year-olds in deprived areas have an even greater chance of being placed on the register than other age groups. And then we see the reverse of that, where we see teenagers are more likely in deprived areas to become um, looked after than other age groups. Other things we looked at was the legal status of the child coming into care. We found that children in the most deprived areas were more likely to come in under involuntary arrangements, and that's under legal orders such as emergency protection orders and care orders in comparison with more affluent families who are more likely to have voluntary agreements between the parents and the trust. We also saw some rate variations in rates between health and social care trusts. Um, we couldn't test for this um, statistically because we don't have a large enough number of trusts but what we saw was those in the those lower CPR rates in the most deprived trusts 
those who had um, higher levels of affluence tended to have higher intervention rates, which is kind of counterintuitive. We saw a bit of a mixture of a pattern, but again, with the, the most deprived health and social care trusts, which would be really around Belfast Trust and Derry area, tend to have lower rates of lack as well. So I said, part of a key element of what we were trying to do was look at comparative research and think about how our rates compare in terms of other um, UK countries and how our policy context may influence that. So if we move to the UK comparisons, now we've all, each nation has different ways of calculating deprivation. But if we focus on income and employment, we have fairly standardised measures which we can use to adjust for different levels of deprivation and, and different um, measurement styles. So using that, what we see is actually very, very different patterns across the UK. We see England and Scotland have been particularly high rates. Northern Ireland there in the blue, yes, we see the same gradient, but it's not going up and it's nowhere near as steep as what we see in other nations. In Scotland, some of the rates were 12, 13, 14 times higher. Northern Ireland was very different in comparison to that. We still had the relationship with deprivation, it just wasn't at the same level as we saw in other countries. And again, we see the same pattern in terms of looked after children. Again, the Northern Ireland gradient there in the blue is much flatter than what we see in other jurisdictions. So part of what we wanted to do was think about why this might be. In terms of a policy context, we all have a broadly similar um, child protection system, broadly similar underpinning legislation. Scotland may define a looked after child slightly differently, but broadly speaking, we're, we're all in the same kind of ballpark in terms of defining what a child in need is, what the threshold for being placed in the register is. We also have similar assessment processes and regional guidance. And the only real difference in terms of Northern Ireland is that we've had an integrated health and social care system since the, the 70s. Whether that means we provide a more integrated response that addresses issues related to deprivation, I'm not sure, it's a, it's a potential explanation. There's also very big differences in terms of how our system processes um, child protection referrals and um, referrals to child and family social work. We have significantly higher referral rates, really astronomically higher than we would see in England. They have come down of recent times, but in 2013-14 they were 65% higher than they would be in England, and in 2015-16, 48%. We also know from research, and hardly unsurprisingly, deprivation drives referral. I don't have a graph up on it, but when we compare using like measures, deprivation in Northern Ireland compared with England, Wales and Scotland, it's a fairly depressing picture. But somewhere between 15 and 20% of those populations in other nations have, they have 15 to 20% of their population in the, mo the most affluent areas. We have about 1%. So in comparison with other UK countries, we are considerably more deprived. So that is driving our high referral rates in Northern Ireland. But we also know from, from an analysis that high referral rates mean the system deals with what comes through differently. Kind of quite very bluntly, the system can only deal with so much. So what we see is lower intervention rates in Northern Ireland. If you come into contact with child and family social work in England, you are twice as likely to be placed on the register than you would be in Northern Ireland. And that may very well be a function of the very high levels of deprivation and the very high levels of demand. Now that's a fairly negative interpretation. There are other things here that I do think make us quite different as well and on a much more positive denote note. We have, for various different reasons, have a very well developed community and voluntary sector. These kind of services are those crucial family support services and some of the kind of specialist bells and whistles services that we rely on in Northern Ireland have been utterly hollowed out in places like England. You know, many social work teams simply don't have services to refer on to. There's not that community base to draw on. We also have developed integrated family support hubs. We're trying to deal, and you know, we talk to social work practitioners and people who work on these kind of, uh, in these kind of areas as part of this process. And 
our sense was that they had a very different understanding of poverty than we would see from practitioners in other countries. They understood how much of an impact it was. If they hadn't grown up poor themselves, they knew somebody who had been. This wasn't something that you know, they drove through the city of London and, and missed or didn't see poverty. It was on people's doorsteps. They were aware of the impact of it. And people have thought the family support hubs have provided another avenue to provide integrated support to um, children and families in need, which kept them out of the statutory system, which may then contribute to our kind of lower rates as well. As part of this, what we've been trying to do, because I mean, in essence, what I'm really saying up here, and this is no surprise, you know, yeah, poorer you are, more likely you are to be on the register. There's no shock to anybody whatsoever. Anybody who's worked with families, anybody who's a social work practitioner who works in the community knows this to be true. What we wanted to do was to quantify it and draw attention to it, because I think we're so used to this being the case that we've stopped actually thinking about it. It's become utterly invisible, and we're not necessarily thinking about the way poverty and the stress that comes with that impacts people's lives and impacts the issues that mean that children come onto the child protection register. So I think that needs to become a much more integrated part of what we do. So at a policy level, in terms of what we want to do going forward, and I'm pleased to say we've had an awful lot of support from the Department of Health in terms of um, being an advisor to this study and developing initiatives. And we're working with them on those currently, is we want to ensure that families get direct help that maximise their income and help to manage any kind of housing and other difficulties that they have. And at a practice level, we want to make sure that social workers, but also other professionals, really have a good understanding of poverty, how it links with a whole range of risk factors, and how to make sure that that is being included within assessment processes. At a data level, as a researcher, no researcher worth her salt doesn't end with a, a call for more data to be made available, um, we need to ensure that we do routinely collect this. It, it is shameful that we do not know the circumstances of children who come into care at this point in time. You know, we can take some good for it. Deprivation is still a key driver of our intervention rates. It's flatter than it is in other nations, but we want to monitor that on an ongoing basis. Ideally, we want to see it come down and become flatter. We certainly don't want to see it going up and becoming steeper like we see in other UK nations. Okay, folks, if you're interested in finding out more about this, please feel free to visit the project website. There's a number of papers from all the different nations, papers on the case studies and also some stuff about UK comparisons. And equally, if you want to have a discussion about it or follow up on anything, please feel free to give me a shout as well. Okay, thank you.